So Peter Carroll's uh, Libra Chaos is a very interesting read. Um, I selected some of my favorite parts that uh, I thought would be interesting to talk about and hear other people's opinions on. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Uh, he begins with a relatively accurate description of three of the most familiar paradigms that most people develop. He defines these as transcendentalism, materialism, or magical. Transcendentalism is, in each case, it is believed that some form of consciousness or spirit created and maintains the universe, and that humans, other living organisms, contain some fragment of this consciousness or spirit, which underlies the veil or illusion of matter. Spirit is the ultimate reality to the transcendentalist. And then in materialism, <clears throat> in the materialist paradigm, the universe is believed to consist fundamentally and entirely of matter. Human behavior is, is reducible to biology, biology is reducible to chemistry, chemistry is reducible to physics, and physics is reducible to mathematics. The goal of the materialist, who avoids suicide, is the pursuit of personal satisfaction, including altruistic satisfactions if desired. The magical paradigm, the final one, uh, believes that ether is a sort of life force, present in some degree in all things. It carries both knowledge about events and the ability to influence similar or sympathetic events. It is information which structures matter and which all matter is capable of emitting and receiving. Personally, I, I do think it is helpful to identify all three of them before determining before determining an absolute opinion for yourself. Most people, I think, are sort of grown up only to be familiar with one or the other, if any of these thoughts, and even the mere awareness of different ways of looking at the universe for what it is opens one's mind incredibly and therefore allows them to make more of an informed decision rather than the usual conditions of only being introduced to one as the right one and not allowing for the slightest consideration of any other. His concluding description of the three main universal perspectives are as follows. Magicians see themselves as participating in nature. Transcendentalists like to think that they are somehow above it. Materialists like to try to manipulate it. I think that what he is saying here is that transcendentalists think that matter and earth are merely like a gift to them and that their actions aren't necessarily important because they believe it's insignificant compared to the spirit realm. The materialists believe that they can reduce it down to simple equations and thus have complete control over matter during their time here in the living world. And magicians see themselves more as equal to and part of the natural world, and their ultimate identity is not above anything here. Rather, it is entangled in the events and materials they experience. One of my favorite quotes of this article is Carol's following statement. Now, this universe has the peculiarly accommodating property of tending to provide evidence for and confirmation of whatever paradigm one chooses to believe in. And his explanation of this is presumably at some deep level, there is a hidden symmetry between those things we call matter, ether, and spirit. He concludes this section by saying the transcendentalist has faith in his God self, the materialist has faith in his reasoning self, and the selves of the magician have faith in each other. Naturally, all these forms of faith are subject to periods of doubt. And I'm assuming he suggests that perhaps we, go, we all go through stages of all three paradigms, or at least there's evidence enough to convince us of one or the other at certain times in our lives. His introductory section into discussing the actual chaos magic serves somewhat as a warning of confusion and an ultimate lack of control and identity. With a somewhat comedic tone, he suggests laughter as a remedy for some of the darker realizations that one is presented with during their studies. He, he explains that in chaos magic, beliefs are not to be considered final or even ever fully possible. He states that nothing is true, and beliefs are to be temporarily exercised to reach certain desired effects and then discarded of the moment they become unideal in circumstances. A method he recommends, and I quote, is fake it till you make it. When performing chaos magic rituals, which at times will require different states of psyche, as well as various representations of doctrines or directives, all depending on what the desired outcomes may be. He declares our subconscious creativity and parapsychological powers are more than adequate to create or destroy any god or self or demon or other spiritual entity that we may choose to invest or disinvest belief in, at least for ourselves and sometimes for others as well. Another of my favorite quotes he uses is, Magic appeals to those with a great deal of hubris and a fertile imagination, coupled with a strong suspicion that both reality and human condition have a game-like quality. The game is open-ended and plays itself for amusement. 
Players can make up their own rules to some extent and cheat by using parapsychology if desired. He says that the magician has only one belief, and that is that belief is nothing more than a tool for achieving effects. The true magician seeks not a particular identity, but the ability to assume any identity and to not be restricted by any single identity, belief, or culture, thus giving him the power that anything is possible through the true magical perspective. He suggests assuming the idea that if nothing is true, then everything is possible, before he describes what he calls the five classical magical operations, which are enchantment, divination, evocation, invocation, and illumination. He expresses the importance of a skill that the magician must master for success in any of his endeavors. That skill he calls sleight of mind, and goes on to explain it as, a, as similar to when people say, don't think of a white elephant, your mind automatically thinks of a white elephant. Well, according to Carol, this is a disability, which is essential for the magician to conquer. He does admit the impossibility that this presents, but it is but it's sure that with proper study of the five classical magical operations previously mentioned, uh, these will aid the magician in developing the capability of avoiding precisely such mental manipulations. Firstly, Carol describes the use of sleight and mind during enchantment rituals. An example he uses is gathering a few small rocks, naming them after your enemies, and then trying with all your might to bang the stones together with genuine anger, whilst forgetting the names and devoid of any desired of any actual desired outcome, basically unleashing pure anger at the stones unconsciously, after consciously giving them the qualities of your enemies beforehand. Keeping the stones together in a specific bag as a talisman and recharging them to the same effect is recommended, each time allowing only the subconscious mind to operate the emotions. Thinking too consciously of the subjects or your desired outcomes for them will only weaken the magic you are performing. Trust that the very first time you consciously began the ritual is enough to direct the energies in your favor. Don't be too picky about the results, just trust that your subconscious emotions will remember and act sufficiently at each recharge. Apparently, this is a common theme throughout performing most kinds of magic. Although the subconscious does most of the actual working, the conscious mind's role is just as significant in the identifying the elements and ultimately the overall generally desired effect. Working them together this way is a technique which is utilized in almost all spells and rituals. The less the conscious mind is focusing on any of the particular details, the more powerful the outcome. Be confident that your subconscious will always remember and be aware of what the sigils, mantras, artifacts, or diagrams are intended for. Sometimes reception of certain parts of rituals until they become un unintelligible or have lost their conscious meaning has great results. As for divination, the sleight of mind comes into play as well. Divination is usually either done physically with cards or dice, etc., or else visually, staring into a black glass or a crystal ball, tea leaves, etc., um, Carol identifies sortilage or sorting things, shuffling of cards, rolling of dice, etc., and hallucination, staring into abstract shapes long enough as ways of distracting the conscious mind from interfering. Evocation consists first of confirming some entity's presence within one's subconscious, allowing and establishing a certain level of power to the entity, and then finally instructing the entity according to the magician's will. Apparently, this entity is created from the magician being in complete gnosis. Not sure what, what the, that means. And through ritual, he is able to restrict his thoughts to only the creation of this non-physical entity. Pointing out that giving the entity negative characteristics in any manner should be avoided at all costs. Also, preparation is advised because the instructions given to the entity are most effective when attached to some sort of previously developed mantra, mandala, or sigil made during a conscious planning of the event, and so having it ready for the moment's an extreme subconscious so it can be delivered to the entity without having to regain conscious thought whatsoever in order to direct this entity that has been evoked. Another warning he gives is to never attribute extra abilities than necessary to any entity, and that these entities are intended purely as tools and never should the magician begin to take advice or listen to them in any way whatsoever. He recommends a maximum of four entities, one for the execution of complex enchantments, one for divinations where simple techniques may not suffice, one for magical defense and also attack if necessary, and perhaps a fourth for works of octarine magic. In describing an invocation, 
It sounds almost identical to the evocation, other than that the entity provoked is a specific well-known mythical god form. According to Carroll, a successful invocation means nothing less than full possession by the god form, and it appears for similar reasoning as and it appears to, for similar reasoning as the evocations for servitude of some sort. This next part I also found particularly interesting when he says that the pagans were sensible enough to build the whole of human psychology into most of their pantheons and to develop archetypal images to represent all of the various selves that the human organism is composed of. It is for this reason that classical pagan symbolism is so often used by magicians. Here he repeats the fake it till you make it notion and says he doesn't consider an invocation successful until he is surprised by the results. Here he points out that humans are largely influenced by their own actions and environment, and there are multiple psychological experiments to back this notion. The magician realizes this characteristic and uses it to his advantage in that behaving a certain way will in fact convince the psyche that his actions are appropriate and natural. By identifying with certain god forms, he provides himself with a range of beliefs which he can invoke selectively to enable himself as circumstances demand. He should be capable of the actions which stem from the beliefs that he is a superb lover, a courageous and efficient warrior, an intellectual genius, a brilliant businessman, is supremely likable and charismatic, and indeed anything else which might be useful. Again, he warns against attaching oneself to a single essence and reminds us that the ideal of pur purposing these strategies to, be in to being able to utilize many and knowing when and which one is the best that attaching too much to any single identity puts one's own at risk and ultimately will threaten one's sanity. More than once, Carol suggests that we are all made of multiple selves that work together to get us through the situations in our lives. Perhaps part of us are even from past selves. Regardless, we must keep them in sync else we find one or some of them breaking down, as he puts it. Finally, he discusses illumination, which he says when which he says when considering the magician should choose forms of self-improvement which can be precisely specified and measured and which affect changes of behavior in his entire existence apparently illumination is quite similar to invocation except that the goal is for permanent lasting changes in the magician's actual character rather than temporary adjustments used only for particular circumstances it is easier to use realistic and gradual changes than unlikely adjustments or attempts that are beyond the physical bounds of possibility. Again, he reaffirms the value use, the valuable use of gnosis or sleight of mind, as he also calls it, in all five of these magical ritual behaviors. And this statement summarizes it well. The sleight of mind which implants belief through ritual action is more powerful than any other weapon that human possesses, yet its influence is so pervasive that we seldom notice it. It makes religions, wars, cults, and cultures possible. It has killed countless millions and created our personal and social realities. Those who understand how to use it on others can be messiahs or dictators depending on their degree of personal myopia. Those who understand how to apply it to themselves have a jewel beyond price if they use it wisely. Otherwise, they tend to rapidly invoke their own nemesis with it. Here he inserts a strange poem which is worth repeating and not possible to summarize. It's called Liber Boomerang. A god is a god ignored is a demon born. Think you to hypertrophy some selves at the expense of others. That which is denied gains power and seeks strange and unexpected forms of manifestation. Deny death and other forms of suicide will arise. Deny sex and bizarre forms of its expression will torment you. Deny love and absurd sentimentalities will disable you. Deny aggression only to stare eventually at the bloody knife in your shaking hand. Deny honesty, fear, and desire only to create senseless neuroticism and avarice. Deny laughter and the world laughs at you. Deny magic only to become a confused robot inexplicable even unto yourself. Another part that I found extremely interesting is in the next section. He describes our perceptual and conceptual apparatus creates a fourfold division of matter into the space, time, mass, and energy tautology. Similarly, our instinctual drives create an eightfold division of magic. The eight forms of magic are conveniently denoted by colors, having emotional significance. The eight types of magic can be attributed to the seven classical planets, plus Uranus for octarine. 
I'll try to briefly recap these types of magic and their relation to colors as well as planets, to colors as well as planets, which is another concept I've never really heard before, but seems to make sense and fit together seamlessly so far. So first we have octarine associated with Uranus, to which Carol briefly explains as other magicians perceive octarine in different ways. His his own personal perception of octarine is probably a consequence of sex and purple or anger and red being his most effective forms of gnosis. He should seek out the color of magic for himself. He continues, the deviousness of the magician self is a natural extension of the sleight of mind required to manipulate the unseen. The god forms of the octarine power are those which correspond most likely with the characteristics of the magician self and are usually a magician's most important modes of possession for purely magical inspiration. Baphomet, Pan, Odin, Loki, Tiamat, Ta, Eris, Hecate, Babylon, Lilith, and Ishtar are examples of god forms which can be used in this way. Another interesting concept worth noting is when Carol describes the creation of magical languages. It is worth noting here that chaos magical languages are usually now written in V prime before transliteration into magical barbaric form. V prime or vernacular prime is simply one's native tongue in which all use of all tenses of the verb to be is admitted in accordance with quantum, with quantum metaphysics. All the nonsense of transcendentalism disappears quite naturally once this tactic is adopted. There is no being, all is doing. I'm not really sure what this part means. Perhaps someone may be able to contribute some form of comprehension when it comes to this magical language creation. The octarine power is invoked to inspire the magician self and to expand the magician's primary arcana. The primary personal arcana consists of the fundamental symbols with which he interprets and interacts with reality, whatever that may assault perception as. Whatever that may assault perception as magically. These symbols may be theories or Kabbalahs, obsessions, magical weapons, astral, physical, or indeed anything which relates to the practice of magic generally. From the vantage point of the octarine gnosis, the magician shelf, m magician himself should be able to perceive the selves of the other seven powers and be able to see their interrelationship within his total organism. Thus, the octarine power brings some ability in psychiatry, which is the adjustment of the relationship between the selves in an organism. The basic difference between a magician and a civilian is that in the latter, the octarine power is vestigial or un undeveloped. The normal resting or neutral mode a civilian corresponds to a mild expression of the yellow power, which he regards as his normal personality or ego. The magician self, however, is fully aware that this is but one of eight major tools that the organism possesses. Thus, in a sense, the normal personality of the magician is a tool of his magical self, and importantly, vice versa. This realization gives him some advantage over ordinary people. However, the developing magical self will soon realize that it is not in itself superior to the other selves that the organism consists of, for there are many things they can do which it cannot. The awakening of the octarine power is sometimes known as being bitten by the serpent. Those who have been are usually as instantly recognizable to each other, for example, as life, two lifeboat survivors are. The magician who is unable to disguise himself as an ordinary person who is unable to act independently of his own ego is no magician at all. When speaking of black magic, Carol says two conjunctions with the black power are of, partic are of particular interest to the magician, the casting of destruction spells and the avoidance of premature death. So-called chaud rites are a ritual rehearsal of death in which the death self is invoked to manifest its knowledge and wisdom. Traditionally conceived of as a black robed skeletal figure armed with a scythe, the death self is privy to the mysteries of aging, senescence, morbidity, necrosis, and entropy and decay. It is often also possessed of a rather wry and world-weary sense of humor. Chod rites, C-H-O-D rites, are practiced when the magician is familiarizing himself with the feelings of death in order to avoid them. Opposite of those are called entropy rites which are cast towards enemies as a destruction spell and encourages them towards self-destructive behavior. However, this is used as a last resort and is seen as a sign of weakness or inferiority of knowledge. 
Bla Black Magic, Carol Warren. When speaking of Black Magic, Carol Warren's God forms of the Black Power are legion. If the simple form of a cloaked skeleton with scythe does not adequately symbolize the death self, then such forms as Charon, Thanatos, Saturn, Kronos, Hecate the Hag, Dark Sister, Atropos, Anubis, Yama, and Kali may serve. Servitors of the Black Power are rarely established for long-term general use, partly because their use is likely to be rare, infrequent and partly because they can be danger to their owner. Thus, they tend to be made and dispatched for specific or single tasks. Blue magic is actually associated with wealth, and Carol explains how money actually developed many attributes of an actual spiritual being. Although money can affect wealthy experiences, it is not exactly what wealth is. Wealth is defined more by experience, knowledge, and responsibility or foresight. What Carol says about money is quite interesting. Money has acquired all the characteristics of a spiritual being. It is invisible and intangible. Coinage, notes, and electronic numbers are not money. They are merely representations or talismans of something which economists cannot coherently define. Yet, although it is itself intangible and invisible, it can create powerful effects on reality. Money has its own personality and idiosynt idiosyncratic tastes. It avoids those who blaspheme it and flows towards those who treat it in the way that it likes. In a suitable environment, it will even reproduce itself. The nature of the money spirit is movement. Money likes to move. If it is hoarded and not used, it slowly dies. Money thus prefers to manifest as turnover rather than as unexploited assets. Money's surplus to immediate pleasure should be invested as a further evocation. But the truly money conscious find that even their pleasures make money for them. Money consciousness gets paid to enjoy itself. Those in money consciousness are by nature generous. Offer them an interesting investment and they will offer you a fortune. Don't just ask for small cash handouts. When the personal traits of money have been fully understood, real wealth manifests effortlessly. Again, Carol's advice comes to the warning and reminds people that most seminars or lessons about gaining money merely fuel the desire for symbols and talismans of wealth rather than the experiences and freedom that the true wealth that actually gives people joy. However, the majority of those who are poor in relatively free societies where others are rich owe their poverty either to a lack of understanding of how money behaves or to negative feelings which tend to repel it. Neither intelligence nor investment capital are required in any great degree to become wealthy. Before beginning works of blue magic, it is essential to seriously examine all negative thoughts and feelings about money and to exercise them. Most of the poor people who win in lotteries and only the poor regularly enter them, manage to have nothing to show for it a couple years later. It is as if some subconscious force somehow got rid of something they felt that they did not really deserve or want. People tend to have the degree of wealth that they deeply believe that they should have. Blue magic is the modification of that belief through ritual enactment of alternate beliefs. For invocation rituals for blue magic, he suggests various traditional god forms with the prosperity aspect that can be used to express the well self, <clears throat> such as Jupiter, Zeus, and the mythical Midas and Croesus. He also refers to the famous Jim Carrey story of writing himself a check for an absurd amount of money. This can be seen as altering what you believe you deserve, at least in the fake it till you make it sense. He says that spells simple for money are pretty much useless, but rather seeking inspiration for methods of making money are much more successful and will usually have better results once obtained. His warning with blue magic is as follows. Anyone but a fool should be able to devise an investment that offers better odds than conventional forms of gambling. When describing red magic, Carol points out that war is generally a scare tactic with the goal of domination rather than extinction. He says, <clears throat> uh, genesis other than extinction, he says, generally a scare tactic with the goal of domination rather than extinction. He says genocide is not war. He points out that in most cases, the winning side in war or sport is the one with the highest morale over and above any other asset. Red magic is used to invoke vitality, aggression, and morale, but it can also be used as an actual combat magic. Unlike black magic, where the point is extermination, invocation of gods such as Ares, Ishtar, Ogon, Thor, Mars, Mithras, and Horus 
are most helpful in war scenarios. Red magic is used more for intimidation, and so the enemy is usually warned, cursed, and anything to induce paranoia. If they are not made directly aware of the attack, it falls under black magic, entropy rates, and causes self-destruction rather than a conquering of one side over the other. A possible aggression that actual... <clears throat> a truly skilled magician in red magic presents such threatening and effective morale <clears throat> and possible aggression that actual combat is not even actually required. And then there's yellow magic, which has four main components. The ego, or image of self and personality, charisma and self-confidence projected to other people, creativity and sense of humor, and the ability to be assertive and naturally dominant in situations. Success in most societies is directly related to, what, to one's yellow magical powers. When working with yellow magic, it is essential to realize that a personality is merely a part of someone that is owned by them, and not entirely a person, <clears throat> and not entirely the person who they are. Or in other words, it can be worked on or changed without sacrificing true elements of, the, of a person's character. These changes come about by illumination workings, Carol suggests. Retroactive enchantment and invocation. Retroactive enchantment in this case consists of rewriting one's personal history. As our history largely defines our future, we change our future by redefining our past. Everybody has some capacity to reinterpret things which were considered to have gone wrong in the past in a more favorable light, but most fail to pursue the, the process in full. One cannot eliminate disabling memories, but by an effort of visualization and imagination, one can write in parallel enabling memories of what might also have happened to neutralize the originals. One can also, where possible, modify any remaining physical evidence that favors the, di the disabling memory. Further, he suggests one maneuver frequently used in yellow magic is to pr practice the manifestation of an alternate personality with a specific mnemonic trigger, <clears throat> such as the transference of a ring from one figure to another. Various god forms such as Ra, Helios, Mithras, Apollo, and Baldur are useful to structure fresh manifestations of the ego and for experiments with the other three qualities of the yellow powers. <clears throat> when it comes to charisma, again, the fake it till you make it concept is more than effective according to Carol. He recommends that if you are unsure how to begin acting confident, then begin by acting the opposite, act even less confident, and soon you'll see the necessary action to go in the other direction. Another really good point he makes is laughter and creativity may not immediately seem to be related, but humor depends on the sudden forging of a new connection between dis disparate, disparate concepts, and we laugh at our own creativity in forging the connection. Laughter can also be a clue <clears throat> as to someone's own self-worth, since it also takes a degree of positive self-esteem and confidence to laugh at something creatively funny. Persons of low self-esteem tend only to laugh at destructive humor and the misfortune of others, if they laugh at all. <clears throat> the last form of yellow energy, the assertiveness and dominance, can be difficult to determine between people because it's not always based on who's the strongest. They are the more subtle clues as to who is higher up in the social scenarios. Carol suggests this. It is basically exhibited through nonverbal behavior, which everybody understands intuitively or subconsciously, which most people fail to understand rationally. As a consequence, they cannot manipulate it deliberately. Typical dominance behaviors involve talking loudly and slowly, using lots of eye contact, interrupting the speech of others, whilst re resisting the interruption of others, maintaining an upright posture of concealed threat, invading the personal space of others whilst resisting intrusion into one's own, and placing oneself strategically in any space of the focus of attention. In cultures where touching is frequent, the dominant always initiated or pointedly refused to. <clears throat> Either way, they control it. Green magic has a lot to do with the ability of getting people to like you, which can only be done after you like yourself. Like all other types of magic, this must be done subconsciously and subtly, otherwise it will be too obvious and not work at all. A good way to work with this magic is by imitating people's mannerisms, such as posture, eye contact, and social status. You can practice this ability on people that you don't particularly like, and if you can get them to like you, then you are improving your green magic skills. Carol also goes on to mention interesting things regarding orange and purple magic, but I will leave those for for any of you who are interested in further studies of this literary selection.